Philadelphia Fusion. Mmm, interesting. Team preview here with Plat Chat Overwatch. We've got some really cool guests on today. We've got Custer, we've got Avril, we've got Jonathan. And we're going to talk a couple of team previews, but this one is focused on the Philadelphia Fusion. This team, I want to start off, is not a, a full roster at the moment. Or at least I look at them and I think they're probably going to still add more pieces to it. Is that the impression that you get? There's a couple of teams that are like that, where they have minimum roster sizes or like just over. Actually, is the minimum six for this year? That's yeah, right, right? Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's, yeah. it's like you can run a roster plus one seems to be the recent rules. That, that seems a little scary to me as you head into Overwatch 2 when you don't exactly know what the game looks like. You don't exactly know whether, you know, what the metas are going to look like, that kind of stuff. Do you anticipate these kind of teams actually making additional roster moves? We, we've already done the Boston Uprising video, but they announced a fucking new main tank. They've now got three main tanks on the roster. I don't want to dig too much into that, but like some teams are just adding player after player after player. Do you see a roster like this, Avril, and think it's worrying that there's only six players involved? I, when you look at Philly's uh, history, like, they have big rosters, don't they? Like, what, what was the last year? They had a gigantic roster. Uh, they've had like up to 12 players in, in previous seasons. Um, and their history is they, they definitely spend to get players. So this is a different look for Fusion. I'm not just talking about the fact that they're not a mixed roster anymore, but yeah, it's like the smallest roster size for Fusion in quite a while. And they've only got one tank. The standard right now for building a 5v5 roster is that you pretty much need two tanks. Make sure you got everything covered. I think their DPS is fine. They got everything covered there. Um, only two supports. I think a lot of teams would probably prefer three if they can help it. So the ideal team size at the moment looks something like three DPS, three support, two tank for like eight players. So they're two behind in terms of roster size if we're, we're using that standard. Is is that necessary though? What do you think, Jonathan? I mean, in terms of like actually building a roster for the season, something I've been pretty vocal about is that I don't mind small rosters like this as long as you're willing to actually pick people up once there's a public beta and you can tell who's good from yeah. the contenders. Sure, if they invest that amount of money, then yeah, sure. But, you know, we can't also predict that some of these teams will invest that kind of money into their rosters and actually do expand, even though we'd like them to. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I look at a, lot, at a lot of these teams and I just see, like, red flags. And I see, like, warning signs. And it's worrying. And it, in the case of Houston Outlaws, I ignore that. You know, you got Mastro <laughs> on the main support role. You know, I just choose to ignore that warning sign. I was like, I don't need to slow down. You know, this doesn't apply to me. It applies to other, other teams, other people. But in the case of Fusion, I mean, regardless of how great you think Fury is, and it didn't have the best season this past year, you probably want a proper main tank to, you know, play the Reinhardt, play the Winston, etc. Um so yeah, I'd, I'd love to see a couple of pickups, especially for the Philadelphia Fusion. But, you know, they've had the opportunity to pick up some players for a very long time now. And it does hmm. seem like they're just going to chill and wait for hmm. the right time and the right player to show well, up. Let, let's start with the tank discussion. Scott, if you could pick a tank player, uh, we've been talking about this in a couple of our previous episodes of like, if you, if you would trust anyone to solo tank in Overwatch 2, which kind of crop of players would it be? Surely Fury falls into that crop of like unbelievable elite talents that if you're going to let anyone solo tank, it would be someone like that. Yeah, well, it's like, when have you ever watched Fury play and be like, yeah, I'm not content with what he's doing here. Like, he's just always been very good at anything he's ever touched. Fury would be in my like top three, top five uh, like tanks I would pick up to just do it all. And I, I like, I agree with you guys in the fact that like, you really want to have that 3-3-2 set up so that you really feel comfortable with like having everything locked in. I actually don't mind Philadelphia's Fusion's roster. I think it's actually pretty well-rounded uh, overall. I think the three DPS players cover off everything. Fury, as I said, one of those few tanks that I think could really fill those niches. And then you have Aim God and Fixer. You know, obviously that's a couple of question marks around both of those players, but you know, I actually really like what they're doing. Um, and I think Fury can do that. Like, I think Fury, if anyone's going to be able to just, you know, surprise pick Winston and chat it out, I think Fury is going to be one of those tanks. So yeah. I don't know. I would like another tank. You know, Boston has like nine at this point. So maybe they can like <laughs> rent one from them. But like the question that needs to be raised, I agree with you guys. Like maybe once the public beta becomes accessible, you can start picking up people. But we're heavily losing the number of good main tanks in the league that you can just like pick up at a whim that are going to be able to play at the highest level. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them are retiring as well. Uh, uh, for anyone who's watching and thinking, why aren't they doing a full episode about Super? We will, we will absolutely be discussing that on a on a future episode. We we're not recording in the past. We have heard that news as well. Um, I I want to talk about Fury a little bit though as well because when when I think about how how I model Fury is an unbelievably mechanically gifted player. And that doesn't just extend to his off-tank play. If you think back to the times in which he's played DPS, either before the Overwatch League when he was playing like some triple DPS kind of comps, or when you think about the times during the seasons where he's come in and played, like I remember him playing Farah and some... Some other heroes, I can't exactly remember where his hero pool extended in official play, but he was insanely good. Do you think that extends to the main tank thing? Like, is it is it reasonable to take a player that's phenomenal and very flexible because they have outrageous mechanical talent for the game and just assume they're going to be good on winston rhine it's not the same uh, that thing kind of though, you know it's not mechanical skill and it's a different mindset too you know as much as i'd like to get behind this okay just pick up sado okay just get <laughs> sado in let him play the winston and the reinhardt because it doesn't matter how mechanically skilled you are you need to have a certain mindset and a certain understanding of the pace of the game you know the flow of the game um shield management all that stuff and i think we've seen numerous times like very talented players step into the tank role when their team needs it and just it's just not the same like they can do a respectable job but if you're going to compete with like the best in the overwatch league and especially in the apac region which is already insanely stacked like you need a proper at least winston and reinhardt in my opinion if you want to play orisa sure you know sigma of course that you know it's an off tank but like some of these winston and reinhardt picks like just get a proper main tank dude. but is that is that what it comes down to is it literally because i'm trying to get down to you know specifics here if we're talking about somebody like fury i'm not worried about how he plays doom i'm not worried about how he plays orissa you know like you know post rework yeah. orissa where the leaks are that she's much more mechanically like demanding with like a yeah like a skill shot like accretion kind of thing i'm not worried about those kind of things when it comes to players who are like fury is it literally just ryan winston i mean even winston has a fucking uh, apparently has like a pium like fucking i don't even know what that <laughs> ability would be called mechanic. But, winston you know, yeah. has one aim mechanic uh, we'll see i don't know yeah, <laughs> I, go on? I, go on. I, I go on john I, I think philly should go for aimon oh philly I... should go for aimon <laughs> I, I like it. I'm, I'm on the board. You, beat, you like he it? He beat Bumper one no. time. He beat Bumper one time. I was actually joking, but Scott's on board, so now I'm going to double down as well. No, no, I'm I, just, gone in. I, I just <laughs> have someone to, like, just fill the blanks. Like, Among, he never mm. plays until we hit this one Wrecking Ball meta, and then Among's like, just, you don't even need to communicate. Just go, Among. Just go, go forward, and we will Roll follow on, you. Son, like I, I, Avril, a I secret agree. agent here on behalf of Tactical Crouch, about to clue to ruin Pat Chat's reputation forever. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, um, I, got, I got more. We can do. <laughs> no, okay. but I think to, to speak to Johnny's point, though, yeah. like yeah, I think you do want to have a. As far as main tank goes, you're competing against guys with thousands and thousands and thousands of main tank hours, and then you know a bunch of that is also like actual professional hours in matches as well, and you know I, I think. The, the one thing about off-tank plays to kind of change up mentally is, you know, their job is going to be different as a solo tank because you need to be able to be the guy that kind of, I don't know if I'm going to explain this properly, but to, to take space and hold it like a main tank would instead of being a more utility-based player that off-tanks have been in the past. Mm. Uh, I, just one, sorry, one final question before yeah. we move on from this topic, right? Just to get your, your guys' thoughts because we don't always have you on the episodes, do If... If you're thinking about solo main tank play in for next year, do you have more faith in the historic main tank players like Smurf, like Fate, like Gaga, those kind of players who are, I mean, Fate is not the only tank on his team, but uh, Smurf and Gaga are. That, do you have more faith in those kind of people or do you have more faith in people like Fury, Void, Hanbin, those kind of off-tank players. The more you learn about what the tank role means in Overwatch 2, which way which way do your brains go in terms of being comfortable in that sense with certain people? Uh, I, I, you want to go, Scott? I, I think the, uh, for me, the answer is like, 
I don't think we really know yet. And like, obviously that's a cop out and I'll have to choose a side. I would personally go more for off tank. I think main tank has always been a very like standing in the front line and just sort of like working with the team. Why I feel like off tank has re been required to have a lot more utility and map awareness of you need to know when to go aggressive while also when to peel. And I think that's more in line with what's going to be required from Overwatch 2 solo main tanks. I, I'm on board with off tanks as well. I, you know, guns to my head, I, I probably have to pick off tank. Um, and it's because it, to me, it's going to be more difficult to pick up off tank mechanical skill than the other way around. Not to, um, you know, underrate main tank players too much, but um, really for off tank players, it's about learning the role more than learning the mechanics in a way. At least that's my position on it. Sure. So, yeah. Just it, it's also list. just like math. Oh yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> taking <laughs> very, very, very you know, Be careful with your language. I'll kick you out. Um, but it's also just simple math. Like there are just more off tanks than main tanks in the game. Like you, you, you asked earlier, sideshow. Like if you picked up a main tank, like Sato, what would they play? Well, it'd probably be Reinhardt, Winston, um, and that, that's. Yeah, I mean, but but still, but, like but even, even wrecking ball yeah. to an extent, I could see like an off tank like picking up relatively quickly, similarly to a main tank, because like what signature main tank skill is there behind playing wrecking ball? It's really just something that you know Winston players have adapted to and learned, uh, you know, the uniqueness of wrecking ball with. But it's nothing that an off tank couldn't pick up if they really dedicated themselves to it. So, and you know, Doomfist coming in as well, Orisa rework. Like I think. Basic math as well, just like there are more off tank heroes and more mm -hmm. off tank skill sets than there are uh, solid main tank skill sets coming over from World One. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thought experiment too. Let, let's dig back into the roster though. Philadelphia Fusion, if we pull it back up, uh, the support line, right? This team has Aim God Fixer. They are obviously in the situation, Philadelphia, where they were anticipating having Alarm and it's unbelievably tragic that he's not with us again and not going to be playing for next year uh we went through that when we were doing our you know greatest of all time rankings as well and, and when the news hit too but this team has ended up in a scenario where they're looking towards 2022 and this is their support line how how does that where are the confidence levels at, do you think, Avril, in terms of what Aim God and Fixer are going to be able to provide to a team that is looking to punt towards the top kind of echelons? This team has to have those level of aspirations by just virtue mm -hmm. of the fact that they have, you know, big names like like Carpe and Fury, if you if you want to start as basic Barry as that. Yeah, this is uh this is the hard point of the roster. I think everyone can agree that it's a very front loaded roster. Great DPS, great tank. Then you look at the supports, it's it's looking a little bit weak. Um, and potentially, you know, where a lot of the fans will underrate this roster is in the support line. I say underrated, they're, they're probably even potentially rating it correctly, just that it's not particularly exciting. Um, I, I casted Aim Gods last season of Contenders, and it just so happened to be Team CC, the team that he was on, which is the Shanghai Academy team. That was like their worst season so far in Korea. It was not great. And they still came like, you know, made it to playoffs got within you know the top they were like fifth place but this this is a team that's supposed to be fighting for a championship in contenders career and they were in like fifth place so are you saying that that great. was a direct correlation between playing with them um i'm i mean there's a bunch of different factors in there but um i i didn't really particularly think that aim god was doing anything special in the team uh he was a very serviceable player that's not what you want to hear for a team for the philadelphia future you don't want to you don't want to hear the word serviceable um, so if that's the best word I can use to describe aim God, I think he's, the other thing is I, I almost want to say like, does he have potential, but then he's been a pro for a while. He's been in the Overwatch League. We've yeah, kind of yeah. seen him. We've, we've seen some good moments, but nothing that really blows you away. And it's going to be impossible to fill alarm shoes anyway. If you, if you had alarm on this team, different story, I think the, the confidence for fusion be way up. Um, it just isn't there for aim God. And I mean, I can keep going about fixer if you want, but, uh. Well, let's let's uh, keep it on Aim God for the moment. What, I mean, we've we've all watched him for many years. I mean, Avril's right; he's been in the league since 2018, and even before that, he was a relevant player. Even well, somewhat relevant before Overwatch League even kicked off. Too, he was a player that you'd have you know your eye on. So, this guy, if I remember correctly, I think he was broadly considered to be, you know, kind of a, a what fourth kind of best in that 2018 season. Is that fair? Like, he was 
pretty decently considered in the very, very first year of Overwatch League. And then Didn't just we kind of... Did higher than Nico? Did we? I thought he was... Neko was pretty good that season too. Ne Sorry, Neko was, Neko was rated really highly and then Aim God came in at the very end, didn't he? And yeah. he looked... He looked very good for the period of time he played. Anyway, does it even matter? That is ancient history, and also the game has developed massively since then. So is that even a relevant measuring stick? I don't even feel like it personally is. What well, what are your confidence levels at? I mean, you, you used to play <laughs> you used to play support Custer, so I'm gonna rely on you here. Uh, I, I think Aim God for me is like, we just looked at his highlight package, right? And he has some crazy nutty peaks. But the thing that's always stood out for me with Aim God is when he has those peaks, he also has these really bad games where like, especially when his teams weren't doing well, he's just flanking into the back line as like a Zenyatta and stuff like that. And not really having like a calm measured approach to the game. Obviously, it's been a while since we saw him, you know, really play on like play in the league. Maybe he's had that whipped out of him as a player. He's gotten older, gotten wiser. Mechanically, I think he can do what he needs to, but I have yet to see him consistently perform at the level of a highest flex support, especially as the role just keeps improving year after year. There are outrageous talents in the flex support yeah. position. It's one of the most stacked positions in the whole of the league. I think that especially from everything we've heard about Overwatch 2, from what Molly said, from what uh, we're uh, kind of inferring from the state of balance within the, like, Gunba's workshop mode and stuff, it seems like there's going to be a lot of pressure on those flex support players to stay alive and to get value when they're under a lot of pressure. That seems like a rough area to be in. Are we expecting, like, league average from this guy at, at, at kind of a best-case scenario? I wouldn't have high expectations. I wouldn't. I wouldn't yeah. come in and be like, "This guy is definitely not rivaling around alarm." That's. I think that's the that's the clear yeah. thing to start from. Do not think that he's going to just, you know, be able to hit the same heights as alarm. At least not off the bat. I think the best you can get out of him right now is to hope that he lands somewhere closer to where he was in his previous Overwatch League seasons. Especially if we're talking about him being good on Boston, even though that feels like forever ago, right? Yeah. I think that needs to be like, hope that he can be that good, uh, but but don't expect him to be like mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of mind-boggling to me too because he's such a known quantity as well. Like we we talk about him and he's had so many reps under his belt. I mean, he's been in the Overwatch League since in 2018 and now only had one season in Contenders actually. But like we kind of know what we're getting with this guy. Doesn't have the best resume either. Like even if you look at like what he's accomplished since then, um, even like some of the rumors about how he operates as a player within a team. Um, you know, I think there were some rumors coming out of Boston season one that he wasn't. The, the there was a lot made. of shit coming out of Boston season uh, one. Yeah, Boston was just a <laughs> shit show as well. So maybe it's not his fault. But also, like, if you're retooling your roster like Philadelphia Fusion are doing, I think there are better talents in Korean contenders. And Avril knows a lot better than me when it comes to this because he's watched way more footage. That's actually been his job, you know, commentating Korean contenders. <laughs> but there are flex supports like Quasid, for example, which I've just watched a little bit of, and he's like a young talent. He's exciting. He has some good performances in mm. the region. And instead, Philadelphia Fusion are opting for like a known quantity, a veteran in this case. And maybe you want him to bring that kind of experience to a young roster. But it kind of just puzzles me. Like, what, what is your end goal with Aim God? Do you really think that he's this good, that he's going to be able to elevate the team compared to securing like your, like securing a young rookie that is talented and have him like grow under your team, under your franchise before another team like Soul Dynasty, like sweeps in and, you know, signs someone instead to go alongside uh, creative. So uh, I don't really understand the signing, I suppose. Uh, and, but he's a known quantity. Fusion had Krillin on, on their academy team in T1. I'm not like going hard to bat for Krillin because I don't think he's going to be one of the top signings either Best uh, for Washington. But yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but T1 did super well in their last season, um, and that was the, you know the probably one of their best seasons ever. And they had to bow up because of COVID issues. But I had them going in the finals against O2 Blast. Uh, so T1 were a monstrous team. That speaks well to their DPS line. But I guess my greater point, going back to Aim God and um, the the support here, is like you mentioned Quasit, Johnny, and it's like yeah, I got I got my eyes on Quasit as well. But for some reason, and I I don't know what it is. Maybe he just didn't do well in trials. But the teams have kind of passed on him. When to me, he he was one of the more, you know, better up and coming rookies that could be going to the league. So, you know, I saw good things, you saw good things, but 
Philly didn't Philly didn't go that way, go in that yeah. direction. So, well, let's let's move on to the partner then that he's going to be playing with, which is Fixer. Now, Fixer's currently underage. I haven't looked into it. I assume Fixer turns eighteen before the beginning of the season. Am I incorrect in that assumption? Yeah, so right on the right on the edge, May second, right, that right. same week. <laughs> but, but he is going to be full time scrimming with the team. He is going to be full time prepping with the team, and then they're going to just launch into the season. So it's it's really not a concern whatsoever. Um, what what do you think? I, I'm concerned about any team that only has two supports and is investing very heavily into the the main support dynamic. But from the vods that I watched, I actually really thought this guy's got talent to work with that was my takeaway from watching some of fixer was this guy's got something going on here like this is a decent pickup what what were your what were your impressions from this signing i haven't watched any of this game <laughs> I have I, not, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I've watched, yeah i'm the same i've watched like bits and pieces but i haven't specifically watched fixer in a while no. i've never okay. seen this game i'm doing life, the grind actually, yeah, no. I'm <laughs> studying for contenders, going through all the rookies, going through everyone. I haven't reached the point where I'm studying Boston Academy. So, okay, I'm not quite there They have a lot of good yet. players, though. Like, and that's the interesting yeah, thing about did. this Boston Academy team. I think they promoted four of their players or something like that a to lot. this league. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I watched something going into the offseason after these contenders finals happened. Uh, Fixer didn't stand out to me specifically, but I can't speak to that because I wasn't directly looking for him. From what I've heard, he's a really solid pickup. I think he is... I think he is one of the good up and coming talent that Avril was talking about, where it's like, it's worth investing in case that this is very necessary. Um, and that's why having aim God as a known variable is really useful because all of a sudden you can really start to weigh Fixer's well, impact into the game. Yeah. Well, let me talk a bit about what I noticed with Fixer because I'm not going to claim that I've watched a shit ton of, uh, of Fixer, but I did spend some time watching the Boston Academy VODs because they did promote so many players, right? So it seemed relevant to pay attention. And even when I was <coughs> even when I was watching VODs just to look at, for example, um, Victoria, I ended up sometimes focusing on Fixer quite a bit because he stood out to me. He he was actually a player that when from my point of view, when you tend to look at a lot of contenders talent who play main support, they find it difficult often to balance the aggression and playmaking with not getting punished. That seems to be a really big theme for contenders' main support players. They'll go for a play, and that, that applies to Brig and, um, and Lucio play. They'll, they'll go for a play, and they'll just get hard shut down because either the timing was incorrect, they didn't map it around the abilities that the opponents had, or like the timing of the, um, the aggression cycles coming in. But Fixer seemed like he had a good understanding of when he could make those plays, and he was getting decent value out of it, and he wasn't getting punished too often. And that, to me, was already a good sign for somebody moving into the Overwatch League because a lot of people at that uh, tier two level end up missing that equilibrium completely where they're trying to get huge value all the time but get punished or, or too far the other way where they just don't make those big like team fight uh, changing plays. So I, I thought this guy looked pretty promising actually heading into uh, the Philly Fusion season. I think it doesn't really assuage my doubts though about what this backline looks like as a whole, because I think it's going to be so difficult for main support players in Overwatch 2 to make more impact mm -hmm. than the flex support player. And I think we've already, you know, discussed to death uh, the the aim god idea here. But you have you have a very traditional backline of flex support, main support. And even if I even if I quite like the main support player, I just don't see a world in which that's good enough to make this a top level backline. You're, you're still like, you've got aim got a known quantity and a promising main support, in my opinion, but it, it's not, it's not going to be world beating. No, I, I, I think, you know, uh, this is going to have to be a player that um, you're hoping for good things from his time on Uprising Academy. I'm going to be honest with you. Like I obviously I was joking earlier when I said I never seen him before. I casted him in T1 when he was on T1, but NA contenders and EU contenders is a bit of a blind spot for me. Um, Sorry, I just, you know, too busy casting off Watch League, anchoring contenders and Australian contenders and There's watching an all the Chinese contenders. Amount of stuff oh, I'm going to need you to step it up. I apologize for uh, <laughs> not also watching NAEU, my bad. Um, no, so it's a bit of a blind spot for me. I didn't see his development after T1. All I got from him was his time on T1, and that was the year before T1 got good. This is right. T1 had an atrocious year, and then they had a fantastic year, and Fixer was on the atrocious year. Uh, and it's hard to like look at him and on that year be like, oh, was it his fault? Is it the rest of the team? What's going yeah. on? They were all just underwhelming, all six of them. 
nothing to nothing really redeeming about them. There's the same team that Nice was on. Not that I got anything against him, but my point is that T1 roster from 2020 that he was a part of, not inspiring at all. So I, I'm hoping he had a lot more to show on Uprising Academy because if it's just from what I know of him on T1, then I'd be a bit worried. But it sounds okay. like he made a lot of good moves on uh, Uprising Academy and that he was actually pretty good. Well, let's talk about the DPS line then because that I think is the most exciting. And uh, l listen, spoiler alert, most of the teams next year are carried by their DPS line. I don't think yeah. that's an unfair statement. Most of the teams that have been formed for Overwatch 2, the exciting element is that they've got stacked DPS lines. It, it, there's a lot of questions about various different support lines. Who the fuck knows what's happening with Tank in 2022? <laughs> so it's, it's mainly about DPS. So this DPS line has Carpe, a... Uh, a, a potential goat candidate in terms of DPS, but you know you can, yeah, you, you can you can argue that one. We didn't have him <laughs> too high up on the list, but he was certainly he was on our top ten, along with the new coming talent of MN3 and Zest. Um, I want to start with you, Avril. How excited are you for MN3 and Zest? Oh, so excited, so excited that it pains me to see all the fans and even a lot of Philly fans just be like, oh, we got all these rookies. It's like you got some exciting rookies though. MN3 Zest as a duo, they're monstrous. They are so big and so uh, so much part of, I think, the reason T1 success last year as well. Like two of the most exciting talents in uh, Contenders career that are not called proper. And I think, sure. I think the proper narrative also dominates a lot of conversation around Korean content. I apologize for that, by the way. I think I started that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so anybody, so I think a lot of fan narrative starts from like, well, if he's not proper, then he's not relevant. You know, only proper is relevant, and anybody else is not called proper, just forget about it. But in my opinion, the next best guy was He Sang, uh, which Johnny has seen a lot of, and he's impressed by. But because He Sang's oh outraged, my God, I can't love play. Yeah, he's so he's, good. He, he Sang's going to be the proper of the the year after, and we haven't even started this year yet. But anyway, <laughs> MN three, MN three would be the guy after He Sang for me. So if I go one, two, three, it's proper, bit of a gap. He Sang then MN three. And it's, you know, and in some cases, I might even put MN3, he's saying pretty close together as well. MN3 is super, super good. Like, this guy has the potential that I think he could just bench Carpe. Same here, Paul. And in my opinion, I'm not, like, anti-Carpe, even though I think, you know, some narrative might, might form around that. But MN3, to me, is just, like, a better, younger, higher potential Carpe that actually already has his skill level on par, if not better, in my opinion. I I actually agree to that of like people are like, you know, who's who they're going to compare with Carpe is like, I could almost see them just walking out with MN3 and Zest and I would be completely okay with it. They have the synergy mm -hmm. coming you know, from your, their previous team. And my question becomes for this roster of like, where is Carpe going to play? Because I think one of the biggest issues that Carpe has had historically with the Philadelphia Fusion is that he's been having to pick up the hit scan role then play the tracer role and then play all these different things that he has never really been able to just sort of like specialize himself in a way. Sure. So yeah. I'm curious to see where he's going to end up and what his role is going to be. Is he going to alleviate his hit scan role, which seems like sacrilege knowing, you know, Carpe from 2018. But like, I think we could see a world in which Carpe just focuses more on the faster characters, like the tracer and that kind of stuff and fills that niche of like, kind of like a striker role on the San Francisco shock. Yeah. And I think that would be better for everyone on the team. And they have that really good three DPS rotation. Well, I want to ask that question too, because the majority of the stuff I watched from NMN3 was very hit scan focused, right? It's, he seemed from the stuff that I had watched to be an excellent talent when it came to hit scan, but most of the VODs that I was watching were him playing what I would consider to be like a hard hit scan role. Like, okay, there's Sombra sprinkled in there, there's Hanzo sprinkled in there, but I, I wasn't watching too much of Tracer. Uh, maybe that's just the VODs I happened upon, or maybe that is his hero pool. Who, if you're looking at Tracer outside of Carpe, is there someone you're very excited about that fills that Zest. role from Zest and MN3? Zest. They'll both be playing it, depending on, this is how I see the fusion lineup working. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, but probably Carpe might not even play. It, it, like Cus said, it might just be MN3 and Zest, and they both play the Tracer. This is the, this is the best part about this duo is because they both actually cover the Tracer very, very well. I think Zest is probably slightly better on the Tracer. Right. Uh, and maybe that's a little bit biased because he's played more of it. He's shown to have been playing more of it. I, I haven't seen them in 1v1, so it's hard to tell. Um, but you want to have a DPS duo that can both cover that because that, that was a cause for concern for a lot of teams in the previous season because you don't want to leave situation on Chengdu where he's both your best Tracer player 
and just your best player on everything else as well. So it's like, <laughs> if you want to play the Tracer plus something, Leave can only play one of them. Oh, and then if he Chengdu. plays the, it, poor yeah. Chengdu, they've got yeah. Leave. Oh, so that's so hard. sad. <laughs> oh, it's the so hard is, having Leave when he's the best Josh. tracer in the league and also the best everything else. Oh. Okay, no, but the point is, Josh, they don't have a second person that can fill the shoes, which is yeah, why Imperial is so good for that team. My point is for T1 is it's, you don't have a situation like that where, like, your best tracer player is also your best everything else. And, yeah. you know, you, the other the other DPS just ends up being this black hole. That's not going to happen on T1 because they can fill each other and complement each other super well because this projectile, flexible, tracer, M and 3, hit scan, tracer, done. What else could you want? So where does this... play the Reaper? Is, Yo. that, is that a thing you could do for That's the That's like the only hero in this room. I think Carpe is going to be the Dung Slinger specialist. Yeah. <laughs> <He's swinging. laughs> um... I mean, I haven't even thought about Reaper in Overwatch 2, but that really feels like a hero on its way out. I don't, I don't know. Uh, anyway, but that's a wider discussion about just hero balance overall. But let, let, me, let me ask you this question. If you had to rank this DPS line, just, not the team overall, but just Carpe and M MN3 Zest, and let's let's make it specific to the region. Let's not talk about the league overall to start with. Oh my god! Just the okay, region. Yeah. Let me the, open up the teams real quick. Uh, <laughs> exactly. No, it's a tough question. It really is because you have to think about all of the other DPS lines in the region and try and get like a ranking in your head. Yeah, we're, this is a promising DPS line, but there's also fucking cracked DPS yeah. players everywhere. I mean, yeah. Where oh, do you think it ranks man. in okay. APAC? So you're better than Valiant DPS duo. Yeah, we haven't caught it to them. You're better than Valiant. Guangzhou, you're probably better than Develop and Choice of One. They have yeah. Eileen too, but you know, I think I'm, so. I'm 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 conf thinking about the Develop and Choice of One kind of DPS deal with Choice of One playing the Tracer and Develop hit scan. I'm high on the Hangzhou Spark, so naturally, like Shy Alpha Yi, I think that's a really good duo. Fits Profit. I'm sorry, I don't know, like so how are you, you going to get into? Are you saying they're fifth? Methods? They're only better on paper than Valiant Charge. You think they're the fifth best oh, DPS man. line with, I would, with MN3, first, but probably, Zest, yeah. and Carpe. I mean, they're the fifth best. I am best. so high on Hangzhou. I'm so yeah. high on Hangzhou that I could see people argue that maybe Alpha Yi doesn't isn't well. Alpha Yi is probably yeah. Alpha is better. I'm sorry. Alpha Yi is phenomenal. Yeah, I'm I better. think he's better. Yep. I would Sadly, put I think he's better. I would put them, I would say Hongjo Spark and Philadelphia Fusion DPS lineup. I would say they're around the same. They have a lot of rookies. They have a lot of unknown variables, but they theoretically are sick. So that's where I put them. But I agree. Like, what do we got? Chengdu, Seoul, Shanghai, and like DPS yeah. lines. Am I yeah, missing one? Like, those crazy. are three nutty yeah. DPS they're lines. They're untouchable. Yeah. So if the DPS line is the best thing that the Fu Philadelphia Fusion have got going for them, I mean, obviously, Fury's a very talented player, but he's the only tank on the team. If the DPS line is the best thing going for them, and they're the fifth best DPS line in the region, <laughs> where are you ranking this team overall? I mean, where are your expectations for the team? Is it similar? Is it like, holy shit, this is a good team, but they're also in a stacked region? Because that's that's what I'm thinking when I look at this squad. Is like, yeah, damn, they're, that's a pretty decent team that you've put together there. It's a pity you're gonna not make it to the midseason tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Very glass half full way of looking at it, unfortunately, for the Philly yeah. fans. But it's probably true. Unfortunately for me, they will be battling close against Hangzhou for that middle of the pack fourth place. They'll be battling against them. For me, it's, you know, the Shanghai, Seoul, Chengdu's in the top three pretty clearly. I'm not going to say what order. Shanghai first. But the rest of them, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them, Seoul, I don't know yet. We'll, we'll figure that out. Spark and uh, Philly will be hard battling for that uh, fourth place spot. Unless right. Spark really underperform, or maybe Guangzhou do something spectacular, or the maybe Spark no one will just poaches Valiant into the alert. top. Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! The Spark will underperform. No, right. so Philly oh fourth. My God, Philly will be fourth. This is an unbeliever. <laughs> I, well, I, okay. Here's my thing. I can actually see. Okay, let me help the Philadelphia Fusion fans get out their copium. I think there is a world in which everything goes right for Philly, and that they can end up third. I think they can be better than no, Seoul, and I think they can be better than Hongzhou. Better than, I, better than uh, Seoul and Hongzhou. Seoul and Hongzhou. Seoul. 
Yes, I think there is a world in which Seoul underperforms and Philly really hits their stride. Everything comes together. <laughs> they get their their roster and thing, and they they just run with it. That well, is I, my copium for the fans, Fusions fans. You can you can come I, second in another tournament this year. I think that's reasonable though, and here's the reason why I'm I'm on board with Scott's take. I would still rank them as the fifth best team. Well, actually, maybe fourth best because I think Spark are going to shit the bed. But okay, yeah, I, I would still rank them as like fourth, fifth. But I think the gap between them and Seoul is quite slim and also there are so when i think about the rankings you know how you would plot like uh, your confidence levels on a fucking graph where you have the range bars that are just like you know huge or small my range bars for overwatch 2 are like this they're huge <laughs> because there are so many things that could go wrong with teams and there's so many things that could just happen to go really well there's certain metas there's certain like um just like your tank player really gets the game or something there are so many unknowns heading into next season and there were only there was only two months for these guys to prep on the uh on the alpha so i feel like the even if you have to rank them fourth on paper their potential high and low is much larger than it would be in a normal season because the unknowns are much more prevalent for mm. every team well, i mean talking about the things that we can quantify because i mean you know once you start speculating to unknowns i mean literally i think literally anything can happen at that stage but in terms of where the tangible evidence is, when I compare Soul and Fusion on a one-to-one -one basis, I think the only position, the only player on Fusion that I'm like, I could see this guy outplaying and being better than his counterpart is Fury versus Smurf. And that is only specific to like, what's going to be more important in any uh, given meta. Is it going to be the main tank player in terms of, is Ryan going to be meta? Is it going to be a Winston meta? Or is it going to be off tanks playing Zarya, playing Diva? And that's going to be the predominant meta hero for tanks, right? And that to me will determine a lot of who's better between Fury and Smurf. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the other positions, Creative Vindyne, I think outperformed Fixer and God every day of the week, personally. Creative as well as super underrated. I think everyone underrates him. This guy's got mad talent, you'll see. And then Fitz Prophet Stalker, to me, is just a stronger DPS line than M and 3 Zest Carpe. And, and a lot of that comes from the fact that Prophet and Fitz are so much well known as a quantity, and they've proven so much time and time again, especially last year, where their quality it was in yeah, terms of being yeah. one of the best DPS lines in the whole league, despite their team kind of struggling. Yeah. Well then, uh, Philly fans, there wasn't too much copium. We like your team, but also good luck. I think is the, <laughs> is the overall message. You built a good squad, but also good luck in APAC because that's going to be tough. <laughs> That does it for our Philadelphia it. Fusion team preview then. And uh, we will be discussing later on in the week. We'll be talking about uh, NYXL. We'll be talking about the LA Valiant as well, commonly known as the Beijing Bears. So that'll be, uh, that'll be a fun one too. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we'll, I, I don't know what you'll find there, but probably some DGen stuff. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.